Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. I'll say it again. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Today we're going to do a, a series of studies called The Greatest Commandment? Question mark. All right? and the reason I do a question mark is today uh, the, the world's wisdom is trying to do away with God's wisdom. And what's the beginning of God's wisdom? Fearing God. And they're trying to do away with this. What does the Bible actually say? I'm getting vexed and I'm getting so burnt out on YouTube watching these people like going out and doing interviews and talking about the woke issue, the sodomite issue, the feminist issue, and you have all these people professing to be Christians. Remember we did that study on abortion again? Because they came out with a new argument. Well, life doesn't have any value until the baby actually comes out. And we had to go through the Bible again. And a lot of them claim to be Christians. And I aimed that study at people that are saved because lost people don't care about this. And I just preached the gospel to them, and so should you, brother, says Christ. What gets me is you got these people out there that have a profession of faith. Christ, they call themselves Christian, but they don't line up with the true biblical definition of Christianity. But they call themselves Christians, and yet they don't care what God's Word says. They use the wisdom of this world, ignoring God's wisdom. Number one, fearing God. They don't fear God. So we're going to get into this. The greatest commandment. Turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. Get your Bibles open. I'm gonna. This is just gonna be an intro video, so we'll turn to them. But get your King James Bibles out. Dust off. Brush off the dust. You know. Open the pages and get the pages used to being opened and turned. And you say, "Well, you're being a little sarcastic." No, I'm saying in these last days, it just seems like we don't want good, solid Bible studies in these last days. Before we get started, I'm gonna talk just a little bit. Please forgive me. Um, when I first got saved and born again, it seemed like everyone wanted to talk about the Bible. They wanted to talk about Bible verses, the, the, the doctrines, you know, we talk about the doctrines, the gospel, the Bible version issue, the gospel, um, eternal security, dispensational teaching, uh, the day of Christ, you know, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, it's called the day of Christ. You have the day of the Lord for the Jews, coming back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble time of Jacob's trouble, and then you have the day of Christ for the body of Christ. Body of Christ. Are you in Christ? That's what being a Christian is. Right? Uh, they like to talk about instruction and righteousness. They loved exhorting one another through the scriptures. And in these last days, it seems like they'd rather get caught up in gossip, talk shows, reaction videos, worldliness. They care too much and being distracted of what's going on in the world that they're starting to forget this. They're starting to take this and put it down. There's men in ministry that are doing that. Becoming very worldly ministries and the godly ministry they once had, it's almost non-existent anymore. Okay. Please, please, that's what I'm please I apologize again. If it sounds like I'm being sarcastic, forgive me. I'm trying to be sincere. Get these Bibles back out. Brush the dust off. Open the pages. Make sure you're starting your day with the Word of God. You're ending the day with the Word of God. Make sure you make time once or twice a week to watch one or two Bible studies. You don't have to watch mine, but make sure you're watching good, wholesome Bible studies from Bible-believing, God-fearing. I throw that last part in because it's important. Okay, it's not enough to know the Bible. There's a verse that says that they that hear the Word of God and do it. Not just hearing the Word of God, like you're hearing it today, but taking it, hiding in your heart, and doing it. It takes both to be worth something. Just hearing the Word of God is not enough. You need good Bible studies, even if you're doing them yourself. You might get to the point where all these men are starting to fall away, and I need to start doing Bible studies. The Holy Spirit will bring you into all truth. Okay, I've helped a lot of brethren do the basics on how to put together Bible studies. How to do Bible studies, word studies, subject studies, expository studies. 
Okay, those are the three ways to study the Bible, and you make sure you're doing it. Second Timothy two fifteen, rightly dividing, and that's dis being dispensational. That's what rightly dividing is. Okay. So Matthew twenty, back to the study. Sorry for that little side note, but but I care about you and I love you. We need to get back to but doing Bible studies. We need to get back to focusing on God and the mission, living a life of Christ and being a light for this world, and back to preaching the gospel, leaving gospel tracks. Okay? When God opens doors, witness to people. Okay? Not hiding. Matthew 22, Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. Now some of you guys know these, this verse. The greatest commands. He got Jesus, they're testing Jesus. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. But at the time, he's still preaching the kingdom of heaven. So when we're reading this, the kingdom of heaven, but we're reading it for instruction and righteousness. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven, and he's the lamb, the Passover lamb. And what they're doing is they're inspecting that lamb. They're trying to find fault with that lamb. If you ever know about the Old Testament, how they, they, they prayed the lamb down the street, the, the lamb that has no blemish, it's supposed to be a perfect lamb, they prayed it down the street once a year for the Passover, and then they spend a couple weeks seriously multiple people examining that lamb to make sure it's perfect and then they sacrifice it as at the Passover okay so what this is is this we're at the point with Jesus Christ where he's being inspected and he's being asked all these questions and they're trying to deceive him trying to trick him up how many of us have been there they try to trick us up by asking us tons and tons of questions okay why because they're not seeking they're not seeking the truth. They're just trying to mess you up. We always say there's two types of people that ask questions. Ones that are seeking answers, and ones that are asking questions just to ask questions, because they're trying to get you all tripped up. Hmm. There it is. They're trying to get you all tripped up. Sorry, Brother Christ, I have a little bit of a hard time this morning. Matthew 22, 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. That's what I'm talking about. There's people that ask questions to ask questions because they're tempting you. They're trying to get you to make a mistake. I've done it. I've fumbled around with my talking where I said something stupid. Sometimes they try to frustrate you. <clears throat> I remember one time with my ex-wife that uh, I was trying to point out that what she was doing was wrong, and she got me so frustrated, I said something pretty stupid. Because I got frustrated because she just kept asking questions. She kept pointing out the finger at me, finger at me. She wouldn't look at herself. She wouldn't look at what she was doing to destroy our marriage, and she would just keep pointing the finger at me and questioning me and questioning me. She didn't care about answers. She just wanted me to back off her. She was tempting me. And I remember I got frustrated to the point where I said something stupid. And that goes back to that verse where you don't cast that which is holy among the dogs, neither cast you pearls before swine, lest they turn around and rend you. Some of them will ask questions, 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 trying to find a mistake so they can rend you. Oh, he's got this mistake here. I don't have to listen to anything he says. That's what they're doing with Jesus Christ here. They're trying to find fault, so if they find one fault, they don't have to listen to anything else he says. It doesn't work that way. First of all, Jesus is perfect. He had no fault. But I'm talking about when it comes to brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to men of God, that God puts in teaching and preaching positions. You find one fault with them, that doesn't mean everything they say is wrong. But this lost world today, and even back then, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Even back then, that's how their attitude was. If we can find one fault with them, we can dismiss everything he ever said. And that's what they're trying to do. Asking questions, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now remember, if you've ever done the study on the law of sin and death, when we get saved, the word death gets dropped. We're still under the law of sin down here. There's still physical consequences for our sin down here. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Physical consequences down here. That being said, the law of sin and death is basically if you break so much as one of the laws, you're worthy of hell. 
That's what they're trying to do here. Well, which one? So if he says this one's the greatest over these others, he might have failed these others, which is why he's saying that. Okay. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. There's only three here, but we're going to keep going. Okay. We're going to read all three passages. All thy heart, soul, and mind, and we're going to find strength. There's actually four. And Matthew 3 are mentioned, uh, and Mark 4 are mentioned, and Luke 4 are mentioned. There's also strength. And we're going to, this is what our main study is going to be based off of. How do you love God with these four things? Because today they've been uh, God's wisdom, how God says you to love Him this way, goes over to world's wisdom, where it's just fleshly, it's just your words, it's just an idea in your head. It's not a life that you live. Okay. You can still live however you want to live, and just in your head you love God with all your heart. Just in your bosom, the burning of the bosom, you love God with all thy soul. And then, you know, I mention Jesus every once in a while, so that means he, I love him with all my mind, right? All these false converts. Today, the world, it's, get, it's heading to the one world religion. It really is. The whole world has a profession of a Jesus Christ, of Christianity for the most part. They profess a Jesus Christ. And that one world religion, is, it's, it's here. It really is. Okay. But they don't line up with the Bible. That's why we read that verse about, uh, where is the wise wisdom? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? And we're going to show that in this, in this series of studies. <clears throat> verse 38. Verse 38. This is the first and great commandment. See, Jesus got them because basically what he's saying, they're all equally important. They try to take this verse and they try to make it out like, well, no, he's just saying loving God's what's important. It's not keeping God's commandments that are important. It's loving God that's important. We're going to find out they're one and the same in the Bible. They're one and the same. But they try to separate the two. That's, that's the wisdom of this world. That's man's wisdom trying to justify his flesh and justify worldliness. He separates the two. Okay. But Jesus is saying, they're all equally important if you love God. I'm going to prove this through the scriptures. 39, that's what loving God is, is doing everything you can to please Him and keep His commandments. But He says, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, everything. The prophecies, what God does for us, you know, His promises, His precious promises, they all hang on our love for Him. Okay? Now, you saw me, I got started, I mean, you heard me say that, you know, the, the world's full of false converts. And their biggest thing is you don't judge. We're going to be saying this verse a lot throughout this, uh, the intro. 1 Corinthians 8.3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. With all thy soul. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you understand what that means when it says known? It's not just hearing someone say, I love God. It's when you say, I know that person. How he lives how he acts, how he talks, how he treats people, how he handles the Word of God, how he treats God, giving God glory in all things, giving him thanks in all things, fearing God as a motivator to live for him and do what's right and obey his Word, actually fearing God. It's known of him. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Love the God, Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Turn to Mark 12, 8, 28. Turn to Mark 12, 28. A parallel passage. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the scribes came, and having heard them, reasoned together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? See, that first try to get him to slip up failed, so then they tried again. What is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Here's another very important piece of information that gets added. Okay, when you, That's why you read parallel passages. You read all three tellings. If there's two tellings of the same story, read them both to get all the information. You, if there's three tellings, if there's four tellings, five tellings, you read all of them to get all the information, to get the whole picture. The Lord our God is one Lord. It goes back to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There's only one capital G, God the Father, and only one capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. Son of God, not God the Son. That's Catholic paganism. He's the Son of God. He's God the Father manifest in the flesh. Therefore, He is God fully and completely. The Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. Capital G, God, the Father. There's only one God. And if Jesus is not the Father, He's not God. I don't need to go off on that too much. We've got studies on that, proving that from the Scriptures. Jesus is God. Manifest in the flesh. He's the body of God. God the Father is the soul. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. But the point is, there's only one God. Jesus is saying, there's only one God. And you're to love Him. So when I say the next statement, which we're going to read, I'm talking about the one God. Lord our God is one Lord, one God. If thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And tremble. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. But here in America, and especially in a world today, the fear of the Lord is wax cold. It's not hot, it's cold. Even among professing Christians, the fear of the Lord just almost seems to be non-existent. The Lord our God is one Lord. And here he goes. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Singular. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is where we get the fourth one. Strength. This is the first commandment. And that covers, when we get done with this study, you're going to realize that covers all commandments. It covers it all. Okay? This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. There is none other grand, uh, commandment greater than these. Okay? Love the Lord. But that tells you how to love the Lord. Heart, soul, mind, strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God. There is. I'm not, that's not a question mark, that's an explanation. Of it. There is. There's only one God. Not a pagan trinity of gods. All right? There's only one Catholic G God in the Godhead. And there is none other but He. Verse 33. And to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all thy all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that the, he answered discreetly, privately, discreetly, quietly on the side, not in front of everybody, but quietly on the side, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Once again, talking about the kingdom of heaven. The physical kingdom. Jesus came in to bring in the physical kingdom. Okay. And they were about to crucify their king. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. Now the point that I want to make with here is this whole point off. It's better than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. Remember when the book of Hebrews says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. So why would Jesus say this? Because the offerings became like a credit card for people. Kind of like today when I talk about the, the, the cross. All these false, fake Christians out there have been told that the cross can be a credit card. You can continue living however you want to live. 
acting however you want to act, say whatever you want to say, do whatever you want to do, treat anybody however you want to treat anybody, and you can be part of the world, in the world, loving the world, conforming to the world, and just say, put it on my tab. Put it on my tab. They treat the cross like a credit card. They can just charge it. No big deal. Sin's not a big deal. You know, sinning against God's not a big deal. Well, back then, that's what they were doing with the animal sacrifices. Okay, I'm going to sin against God. I've got a lamb ready for next week. I got two. I got a couple turtle doves ready for when I sin against them. They were using it as a credit card. It's not enough to hear the word of God. You need to be doers of the word of God. You need to be taking God's commands, God's words, and putting them into practice. That's what's more important than the burnt offerings. That's what, what's going on here. It doesn't change the fact that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. They still need to have their sins covered, and Jesus, after his death, burial, and resurrection, now can take away the sins of the world permanently, wash them away, because it's God, the Father's blood, on the cross. You know, feed the church of God, capital G God, only one God, the Father, which he had purchased with his own blood, Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 again. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. You know what Jesus told this guy right here? Thou, he said, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Why? Because that guy was showing that, hey, his life, because Jesus knows people. Jesus can walk up to me, never, I've never seen Jesus in the flesh in a day in my life, and he could know me top to bottom. Why? Because he's God. He knew the man top to bottom. And the way the guy was talking, along with Jesus knowing who he was, his actions, his life that he was living, you ain't far from the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God. Referring to, I believe, referring to the kingdom of heaven. Now how far? Right. His heart was right with God. It was known of him. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Remember today, we're not supposed to judge. No, don't judge. Someone says they're a Christian, they're a Christian. If someone claims to love a God, don't make sure it's the real capital G God of the King James Bible. And don't make sure that they actually love Him the proper way. It's just words. No, don't judge, don't judge. But in Corinthians it says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. You know, the carnal Corinthians, where Paul doubts their salvation, preaches the gospel to them all over again, and it's... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Turn to Luke 10. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Here we go again. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And, the man, and he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. There we got the four again. Heart, soul, strength, mind. And thy neighbor is thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do. No, 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 no. It's just a feeling. Love is just a feeling. It's just something you say. What did Jesus just say here? He said, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right this do. You mean all those things that were listed there are something that you have to do? It's not here. It might start here, but it's not only here. It comes out with the actions, how you live your life. How you treat people, how you talk, how you treat God, how you handle His Word. It's something that you do. This do, and, sh and thou shalt live. Remember, he's still preaching the kingdom of heaven. Okay. You want eternal life, remember? Eternal life. How do we get eternal life today? Believe on the Lord. You have to repent, and then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we get eternal life today. So here, he's talking about, you want eternal life? 
Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. We just did a study recently talking about the difference between the gospel of the kingdom of heaven versus the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, the time of the Gentiles versus the, what's going to be the time of the Jacob's trouble, but when Jesus was physically on the earth preaching the kingdom of heaven, okay, where salvation was only of the Jews. All right? Today, how do you, I'm getting ahead of myself, how do you love God? You get saved with your soul. You get saved. You obey the gospel. You love the gospel. And you hide the gospel in your heart. Verse 29, okay, this do and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Remember, Jesus said, This do. We're going to keep reading about the neighbor, even though we're not, we might do a follow-up at the end of all these studies on the last part where it says the neighbor. But we're going to be focusing on those things, heart, soul, mind, and strength, when it comes to loving God. How do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? But we're going to keep going to prove that this is something that you do. It's an action. This do, and thou shalt live. He says, Who is my neighbor? Verse 30, And Jesus answered, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, we get to, Who's the neighbor? Verse 31, And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The Babel building system. I'm going to apply this to the Babel building for instruction and righteousness. I have experience as a lost person being in the Babel building system. Okay, I'm going to give you a little testimony. I was in the Babel building system. Okay? I was living in a studio apartment. I call, it's a studio apartment, but it was the size of a bedroom. It was half the size of this room. Okay, I was paying like two back when it was not that expensive. I was paying two or two fifty a month rent for this one, it's like a, a room, a bedroom, okay, I was living out of it, all right, I was, I had a job at Rite Aid, a part-time job at Rite Aid, I was stocking shelves, doing the register, and all my free time went to the Babel building system, all right, I was a Sunday school teacher for the grade school kids, I was playing the bass guitar on the worship team for all the services. So I didn't just go once like most people, just go to your one service and you go home. I was going to three service, two to three services on Sunday and one to two services on Wednesday night. I think it got down to one service on Wednesday night and two services on Sunday. Um, I was also volunteering around the, the building itself to do any work that needed to be done around the building, mowing the lawns and everything. Right? I was giving all my free time to them. And I really, I was talking to the Lord earlier, really, really wanted to get into this, and I prayed, please, I, I give it to the Lord. I'm truly saved now, and that's what's important, but I'm trying to point out that these battle buildings are a business. They're just a business. And they're this guy right here that walks around on the other side. Oh, yeah, he, this person's car broke down. We need to take some donations. They have plenty of money to, to give that person money to fix the car, but instead they turn around and take more money from the brethren to get that brother's car fixed or whatever. But for the most part, when everything was up, they're like, I'm here, this building's here for you, this system is here for you, you know, this business, we're here for you, but I didn't need it. So, you know, it, everything was good. All right, I lost my, I, I moved out of that uh, studio apartment in with some guys from the Babel building, the church building, Babel building, and we got a three-bedroom apartment that we could only afford if all three of us were, had a job and were paying, helping pay the rent, all right? One of them decided to sell his car, go travel the world, so we lost somebody. So we need to get him replaced. But instead, the other person said, the second one out of the three said, I'm going to go live with my mom and dad. And that left me hanging. So I had to live out of my car. And the, re and the whole story, I'll get into it just a little bit more. Because it, it doesn't make sense unless I get into it a little bit more. You're like, why do you have to live out of your car? Why did you just Because I was told we were going to get another apartment, two-bedroom apartment together. I was told, uh, my mom kicked me out when I was 18, because uh, I had a big mouth. Okay, I'm not, I, blame, I, I blame her a little bit, but I also blame myself. Okay, I had a big mouth when I was a kid, um, you know, mouthing off. And I could say things that were really mean, can't take them back. That's why you got to be careful what you say, because you can't take them back. Um, and I'd used my grandparents a lot to fall back on several times and I just felt so bad and guilty to go to go to them so I didn't go to them I didn't go to my mom 
I just was like, the other guy was like, okay, we're going to leave an apartment together. You can come stay with me at my mom and dad's house, and we'll go get into the apartment ASAP. Well, I had everything packed in my car, and he comes to me and tells me that he, I couldn't stay at his parents' house because his brother had come home with his family, his wife and kids, needing a place to stay, and the house was just full of a lot of people, and I get that. But he waited till I was already packed out of the house, had no plans, uh, other plans, and then he told me that. So then I was like, well, we're going to get another apartment, so I'll just live out of the car for a while. I can handle that. There's bathrooms at the church. Uh, I can stop by my grandparents' house and talk with them and use the bathroom to take showers and stuff like that. I can live out of my car for a, little, for a couple weeks for us to find another apartment. Well, a week goes by and he decides, well, I'm just going to live at home for a while. And he decided to tell me that. So then when I started looking, it was hard finding an apartment that, like I had before. Uh, believe, believe it or not, I, I, I believe I had it made. And I got talked out of that apartment so I could get those apartments with those three guides. But I had it made with that studio apartment. Okay? It was inexpensive. I could afford it. And in my, in my heart, I was still lost. I, I, I think everything happens for a reason, brothers and Christ. It happened for a reason. But getting back to the battle building system. All right? I told you everything I was doing for the battle building system. So I'm, I'm talking to say, hey, I need help finding a place that's, that I can afford. And not a week after that, I lost my job. Okay, uh, they did some cuts. I lost my job, and I was like, I went to him and said, I desperately need help. Okay, I'll work. Do you know anybody that has jobs? I, I'm not saying I'm refusing to work. I need to get a good job. I need to find a, a place that I can afford. And it was just hard at that time. Not like today, where they kind of claim it's hard today, where it's all out there, but you have to work. But we're dealing with a lot of people that don't want to work. They don't want to work. I want them to work. Right? I told them I'll work at the Babel building. Uh, I'll do this, I'll do that. They left me hanging. And I remember the pastor set me down and said, Listen, that's not what we're here for. We're not here to help you like that. We're not here to help the brethren out financially at all. Okay? We're I'll, I'll say what he's really saying. We're a business. And we'd be out of business if we were actually helping the brethren out financially, like we're supposed to. Remember we did that study on what donations are really for today and how donations today are supposed to be handled? It's not to pay for a building. It's not to pay the salary of that pastor. This is all garbage. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? That's Catholicism. That's paganism. Okay? But the point is, is they start walking on the other side. He passed by on the other side. When I actually fell into a hole where I actually needed help, they walked on the other side. You got to help yourself. You got to learn to help yourself. You got to learn to pick yourself back up. Is that love for your neighbor? Is that love for a brother or sister in Christ? You see him down, you see him hurting, and you, you fend for yourself. That's the average brother or sister in Christ today on, on, you, on online. I suppose on YouTube, on, on the platforms like the messenger platforms, talking pla uh, video. That's, what, that's, the added, that's the attitude I get from them a lot on here. Right now I don't need help, but if I needed help, would the brethren be there? I'm sorry, but part of me is like 50-50. We're going to get to the next one. I'm getting ahead of myself. But it's like 50-50. They won't be there. A lot of them won't. They'll leave you hanging high and dry. So there, I'm, I'm just applying to today, to the Babel building system. When it talks about the priest and he passed by on their side, that's the Babel building system. They run a business. And all the, most of the money goes to keeping that temple built with man's hands up and keeping the pastor fat and happy. Okay? That's where a lot of the donations go for. Then they'll take separate donations for ministries. Then they'll take separate donations to help this brother out or that brother out sometimes. That's not how it's supposed to work. All the donations go into one pool, and that pool is supposed to go back out to the body of Christ. Period. And that includes preachers that might need some help. Paul took some donations. But that's how donations are supposed to be. We did a huge Bible study proving this. So today, the, the organized religion, I'll say organized religion, not just people like Baptists, but Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, they're all daughters of the whore Catholicism. 
uh, all the denominations, Lutheran, Me Methodist, they're daughters of the whore also. And now the Baptist system has become a daughter of the whore. All, right? all organized religion. That's who this priest, I believe, is representing. Walking on the other side. Back then, for the kingdom of heaven, he was re representing the religion okay, of the Jewish people. They're not doing what God said. They're not doing right. And he'd always attack the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They're not doing what God said. So there's your first set of people. Verse 32. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. You say, well, Levite, but it just said priest. And I understand the Levites are the Levitical priesthood. But this is a Levite. I believe what it's talking about is it's talking about the tribe, the 12 tribes as a whole. It's saying, hey, this is a brother. A fellow Jew goes by. Nothing. Won't do anything. Brothers of Christ, I've been there. I've had brethren stab me in the back. They'll say, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. And then when I'm in a time of need, whether I'm in error, giving into the flesh, sin, wickedness, or going through hard times, what do they do? They walk around on the other side. They turn their back on me like that. In a heartbeat. Where's the love? There is no love. They just pass by on the other side. But this is Christ, are we to, I believe we're treating each other that way. We are. God's watching over us. God's taking care of us. But when there's some of us that are in hard times or we're hurting, it's hard, we're quick, it's hard to distinguish between the two, between someone who just shows up. <coughs> I wasn't some stranger at that Babel building that just showed up and said, Hey, I'm one of you. Oh, by the way, I'm living out of my car and I need money and I need this and I need that and I need this. I wasn't some stranger off the street. Okay, I invested, they know me, they knew me, and I said I was lost, they were lost, it's all a false system, but I was supposed to be a brother in Christ. Okay? Even the people of the Babel building knew the hardship I was going through, but everyone just kept to themselves, because oh, we're just here to sing, and, and we're here for the show, we're here for the flesh rise, to get a rise in the flesh, we're here for the fun, Fun is flesh, flesh is fun. We're not really here to actually help one another out. Okay? But that's what I believe this Levite represents, because they think, well, out of all the 12 tribes, you think a Levite would help them out. But he doesn't. He walks around on the other side. Remember, this is action. This is action. Remember, these things do, Jesus said. Well, what's being judged here is their actions, not their words. That priest probably goes, oh, we should help that man, and this man desperately needs God, and, and we love you, brothers and sisters of Christ, blah, blah, blah. But he still walks around on the other side. It's not his words that matter. It's his actions. you got this Levite, oh, well, you're a brother in Christ, and I love you, brother, and I'm here for you, brother, and I'm praying for you, brother, and, and I, I just want you to know that I'm here. But when the time comes, what does he do? He walks around on the other side. His words mean nothing. It's his actions that define what's really in his heart. Verse 33, But a certain Samaritan, Now I still haven't been proven wrong here. People think Samaritan is from Samaria. Uh, that's a Samarian. But you actually look up, it's Samarian. So this Samaritan is not from Samaria. Okay, What is a Samaritan? Remember the Jews, they, have, they will deal with other Jews, and they'll have some dealings with Gentiles, the heathen nations as a whole, but they will have no dealings with the Samaritan. What is that? I believe a Samaritan is a Jew that has lost the inheritance, living among pagan Gentiles. They've lost the inheritance, they've been kicked out. You read in the Old Testament how Jews can get kicked out and lose the inheritance. In other words, they get treated like they're not Jews anymore. That's how bad it is. You're not a Jew anymore. You're not one of us anymore. And it's so bad, we treat you like a dog. We want nothing to do with you. That's a Samaritan. Okay. Remember when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well? I believe it was a Jew by blood. But it was, she was called a Samaritan. 
And she says, we know that the Christ shall come, and this well is Jacob's well. She's talking like a Jew, but she's called a Samaritan. And the apostles were shocked. He's talking to a Samaritan. Why? Because the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. So you think a Samaritan that's been exiled, treated like a dog, spit upon, they almost want to stone you to death, he sees a Jew on the side of the road. What do you think he's going to do? Well, you think he's just going to walk around like all the other people did. Let's keep reading. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him, and bound up him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. It was a Samaritan. I equivalent that today where you have the Gentiles. Remember, salvation goes out into the world. The time of the Gentiles doesn't mean only Gentiles can get saved. It means salvation has now gone out to the world. Gentiles can get adopted in. Jews and Gentiles can get saved today. When Jesus was first preaching the kingdom of heaven, only Jews could get saved. Gentiles couldn't. He forgave some of the Gentiles' sins. He healed some Gentiles' servants, the woman's daughter. You know, the woman he called a dog. He healed her daughter, daughter because of her faith. And the greatest faith he ever found was among the Gentiles versus the Jews. But salvation at that time was of the Jews. Okay. Today, it's the heathens. Mm -hmm. It's the people that aren't part of organized religion. And we're not Jewish. Now, Jews can do this too, have, be, a, be a good person and help people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is talking about people that were exiled. Okay? We were in darkness, and now we get brought into the light today. Anybody can get saved. Okay? But you have somebody, that's, uh, I believe this rep represents someone who's lost. You've got a lost person that knows how to have compassion, that knows how to really love somebody. And you've got these people professing to be saved, professing to be brothers and sisters in Christ, and they have, they'll, they'll talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And here you have someone who's lost, he's exiled, and he's doing what's right. Can someone lost do what's right? Yes, because the laws of God are written on every man's heart. Every man's heart. Okay. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Do thou likewise what the Samaritan did. If someone like him knows how to do what's right, you should know how to do what's right. Brothers and sisters Christ, if the lost world knows how to truly love one another, do, it's an action, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Like I said, the body of Christ is in a bad state today. I think we're going home any day now. But 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. That man had compassion and showed love, that Samaritan showed love for that Jew that was a stranger. He didn't know who that Jew was, but he showed true love for him. What? By his actions. And he came, took the Jew there, it becomes a story that people hear about his deeds, his actions, that define who the man really is. The same is known of him. If you truly love God, there's going to be evidence proving it. So people can say, that person loves God. Today, the average person out there will just say it because, hey, we're in the world of, if they said it, it's got to be true. But there was a time, you go back 50, let's say 100 years ago, and someone said they love God, where's the deeds? Where's the evidence? Today we're in a society where uh, feelings reign. Your feelings, your flesh feelings, and your opinions seem to be the foundation. Not absolute truth. Not true evidence. Not facts. Not the Word of God. Okay. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. We're going to be talking about uh, heart, soul, strength, mind. So it's going to be a long series that we're going to get into. Three times we are told, once in, in each of the three Gospels, 
Okay? Love with heart, soul, strength, and mind. Okay? You say, well, how do you do that? Well, we'll give a little bit of an example of how to do that. Okay? In the book of John, we learn how to love God with all heart, soul, mind. We're going to sum it up into one thing, and then we're going to break it up into the four pieces. Each individual, the Bible talks about how to love God with the heart, how to love God with your mind, how to love God with your soul, how to love God with all your strength. Okay? But John, we don't have to turn here, but John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus is God. Loving Jesus is loving God. Jesus said, if a man love me, or if you love me, keep my commandments. What's the number one commandment today, brother, says Christ? Obey the gospel. And after you obey the gospel and you truly get saved and born again, there's tons of other commandments. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay? I always throw in the old psalm that says, Put no wickedness before thy eyes, thine eyes. Okay? These are commands. We're commanded to be a living witness. We're commanded to be a verbal witness for Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. These are commands. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. I keep coming across so many brethren out there that's like, with the Bible version issue, well, I prefer, oh, the Bible's just a guidebook. We don't actually have to follow. It's just a suggestion. No, it isn't. It's a command. That's how we can start separating the wolves from the sheep. Or the goats from the sheep. Sheep. All these people that are fakes and frauds. Is this a command or is it just a suggestion? If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Not just have them. Just having this book isn't good enough, brothers and Christ. A lot of times, brethren, it's gathering dust sitting on the shelf. You open it up once a week to do a Bible study, to watch a Bible study, and then it just gathers dust on the shelf. Or you have a Bible on the shelf. I wanted to do a video, I might still do a video, having all the Bibles I've collected. And there was a time where people were desperate for the Word of God. They had to go to a battle building. They built a cheap church, a cheap building. It's where the brethren met. It wasn't 501c3. It wasn't connected to the government. And they'd go there because that person was the only person that had a Bible and he would read from that Bible. He'd read from it. Okay? Homes. If you were blessed, the home might have one Bible in the home. And everyone took turns. At, you taught the children how to read through reading the Bible. And whoever could read would read the Bible. And everybody would huddle around the fire or they'd sit around whoever was reading the Bible. And they'd hear the Bible being read. Today, it's the opposite. I've got tons of Bibles, used Bibles, some new Bibles. I got these set of Bibles over here. <laughs> this is a good set. I have them set right there. I got tons of Bibles, and there's not many people that want them. We got more Bibles than people that desperately want it. The Word of God is so readily available today, there's no excuse, but people don't want it. This is a command of God, not a suggestion. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21. Oh, sorry, he that hath my commandments, that hath my commandments and keepeth them is what we're talking about. Having the word of God and keeping it. It's not enough just to have it. If you're not hiding it in your habit, if you're not hiding it in your heart and living it, it's, it's, it doesn't do anything. It's just a piece of paper with ink on it. If you're not hiding it in your heart and living it. I know people that have multiple Bibles in their homes. Not just me. It seems like a lot of the brothers. Oh yeah, I've got four or five King James Bibles. Wait, are you taking one? This is my favorite one right here. This is the one I use all the time. I have it colored and highlighted. Um, are you taking the one Bible, reading it all the time, starting your day with it, ending your day with it, and actually living it? What God shows you, what God teaches you through some brethren, preachers and teachers, do you apply it to your heart and do you live it? Do you live it? All right. Not just to have it, he that hath my commandments, it says, and keepeth it. 
Remember that priest, he's got the commandments, he doesn't keep it. The Jewish people, they've got the commandments, the Levitical laws, and they don't keep it. But you had a, a person that lost the inheritance, excommunicated, has the laws of God in their heart, and he was keeping one of God's commands. He was showing true love for a neighbor. It's the actions that matter. And I get in so much trouble with the brethren, I think I've lost a lot of fellowship with, I think, false converts, but some actual saved brethren. Because I push that it's your deeds that matter, not your words. Oh, you just, you're calling me a liar. I said, your deeds are what matter, not your words. Words are good. We've had a huge study on exhorting the brethren. Yes, we need to exhort the brethren through the scriptures. We need to encourage them to live a life of Christ, encourage one another to live a life of Christ. But it's your deeds that matter when it comes down to the end. It's your deeds. Did you truly get saved and born again? Did you let God save you? Are you still fighting Him and part of organized religion? You're still fighting God and refusing to let God save you, but you're part of organized religion. You have a profession of faith. But you're still fighting God left and right with the life that you're living. You want nothing to do with an actual life of Christ. Being in Christ, you want nothing to do with being in Christ. Now people get on me, oh, it's works-based salvation. No, it isn't. You don't do anything to earn salvation. But after you get saved, there should be some evidence that you are saved. That's what I'm saying. Where's the evidence? Someone said if you're put on trial... For being a Christian, this is going to be the standard. Whether they like it or not, this is the standard that you're going to be judged by. You put on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Do you line up with this? Or you don't line up with false Christianity, worldly Christianity? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 14, 23, jump down a couple verses. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. It's not a book that he grabs and keeps on the shelf. Keeps on the shelf. Keep here is an action. It's what you do. You take it and you put it in your heart and you live it. If you, if you give someone your word, you keep it. I promise I'll be over Saturday to mow your lawn. You gave your word. Now what is keeping your word? You're over there on Saturday mowing the person's lawn. That's keeping your word. Okay? He will keep my word. It's taking God's word, hiding in your heart, and living it. That's what keeping it is. Living it. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 15.10 John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I want to stop there because people love John. They love the book, the Gospel of John. And, you know, they like to take things out of context and try to apply them today when it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. But you have this, the one thing they don't like is how John talks about keeping God's commandments. If you love God, what is loving God? Keeping His commandments. Keeping His Word. Taking His Word, hiding in your heart, and living it. That's what loving God is. But they don't like that part. They'll ignore that part. But they'll grab uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Past tense, but they make it present tense. Like He present tense loves the world. No, past tense. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth on Him shall not, be ashamed, shall, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And they don't like to keep reading. All right, they don't. It's been a while. Um, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth in him... I want to go back because it's been a while. It's been a while. I used to keep reading, and I had that memorized, but when you don't go over certain verses a lot, or just sometimes you have a, what I call a brain freeze. John 3.16... Okay, he that believeth on him is not condemned. That's what it is. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of our only begotten Son of God. That's why that love is past tense. You reject the cross, God's love's not on you. 
His judgment's on you. His wrath is on you. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Those people that don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ. They love their sin. They love their wickedness. They love the world. They conform to the world. They don't love Jesus Christ. In words, they do. This so-called imaginary, imaginary feeling of love, they do. But when it comes to the actual life that you live, your actions, your deeds, that's what real love is. Love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. It's an action. That's where real, that's where real love is. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth doeth truth. It's something you do. Brothers and Christ, don't be deceived by these people. They try to make things up to be works. The Bible is clear, very clear on what, what good works are when you're trying to work your way to heaven. They try to make breathing out to be a work. Talking out to be a work. It is something that you do, but it's not a work. Okay, You still need to come to God broken. True biblical repentance, broken. Having godly sorrow in your heart for your sins that you've committed against Him. Those sins that now the consequences is there's, because of those sins, you're on your way to hell to burn for all eternity. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment, torment, eternal burning. It's fear and it's sorrow that leads you to the cross, leads you to God, saying, God, save me. I don't know what to do. What do I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And Paul talks about how the old man is dead and buried with Christ. You gave your life, that lost life, you gave it to Jesus Christ at the cross. It's something you do. But it ain't a work. But it's something you do. You gave Jesus at the cross. You gave God that lost man. You gave him your life. And he's given you a new life. They don't like to keep reading. They don't. Oh, God is just only love. No, God is also righteous. He's also truth. He's also slow to anger. He's also vengeful. He also is wrath, pours out wrath. He's to be feared. Okay. John 15, 10. We might have done this one, we'll do it again. But if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. If, if, it's a Bible if. What's the commandment, number one commandment today? Obey the gospel. For they have not all obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Obeyed. It's a command to repent and believe, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Come to God broken, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing it to God in prayer, and asking God to save you. Salvation today. You're, everyone's commanded to get saved today. But not everyone's going to get saved today. We're commanded to do it. It is a command. Thank God that He broke me, and I did it. Okay. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I am not the same man I was before I got saved. And in my actions... And my life, I would back up that statement. It's not just a statement, because some people just say it, and it's not true. They still look the same, act the same, talk the same, live the same. All those, all my life, the whole area of my life changed after I truly got saved and born again. I'm not that same man. If you keep my commandments, John 15, 12, it says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. Remember, this is a commandment. That, that you love one another, as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? For greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Brother says, Christ, are you willing to lay down your life for the brethren? There are men in ministry that they become one-man shows, they're out there living their dream life. They're not laying their life on the line for the brethren. Right? Would you be willing to... Stop everything to help a brother or sister Christ out. Yeah, but it's getting in the way, or it might hinder my dream life or what I want in this world. You know, me, myself, and I. It gets in the way of me, myself, and I. 
the self entity, <laughs> the self entity, um, mocking. I am mocking Trinity, the pagan Trinity, but self entity, me, myself, and I. Okay? That a man lay down his life for his friends. Now here's verse 14. Ye are my friends. Remember, a man lays down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Remember, this is talking about giving your life. When you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross, remember, there's no greater love than this. True love for Jesus Christ. You give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. He gives you a new life, and that new life is about keeping His commandments, keeping God's Word, hiding it in your heart, and living it. That's the life of a Christian. But it's not popular today. That's what this verse is talking about. Jesus gave His life for us. Why can't you give your life to Him at the cross? There's a lot of people today that says, I'm the friend of Jesus. Did you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross? There's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life. Did you lay down your life and give it to Jesus Christ at the cross? Are you dead and buried with Christ and raised with Him? Is He your commander-in-chief now? He commands, are you obeying? 1 John 4.12 No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. If we love one another, action, deeds, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. This is 1 John 4.12. How we treat one another, brothers of Christ, shows whether we're like a good representation of Jesus Christ, being in Christ. Our love for Him reflects on our love for each other. That is there. Some brethren have gotten so hard-hearted because they've been hurt a lot uh, by the world, by brethren stabbing in the back. I've had brethren stab me in the back, and I pray I never get my heart so hardened that I start having hate. I know a man that just it just seems like he has more hate for the brethren and for the world. And he used to preach that true love for the lost world is preaching the, is action, preaching the truth to him, preaching the gospel to him, witness to him, pleading with them, with the truth, the gospel. You need to get saved. That's true love for the lost world. Now his attitude is let them all go to hell. He used to have love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Now he's stabbing them in the back, in the back left and right. Kicking them to the curb like they're nothing. First Corinthians 8.3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you love God? Oh yeah, I love God. Well, we're going to get into the three parts here. You know, the heart, the mind, the soul. The strength. And we're going to see what the Bible says. How do you love God with all your heart? How do you love God with all your mind? How do you love God with all your strength? How do you love God with all your uh, mind, soul, heart, strength? How do you love God? Well, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to wing it. I'm just going to go with what the world says. We're going to get in here, brother, says Christ, and we're going to do some solid, solid Bible studies. And this is convicting me as much as it's convicting you. Am I truly loving God 100%? Remember it says with all, not 90%. Sometimes it seems like I'm at 50% on a lot of these four, on these four things. I'm at 50% some days. Some days I'm at 90%. Some days I feel like I'm at 100%. But is Christ, it doesn't say not 50%, 20%, 10%. At least there's a little bit there. It says with all. All that is in you. And I have failed the Lord a lot. Especially in these last days. I have failed the brethren and I have failed the Lord. I'm struggling. I know you're struggling. The solution is we need to get back to the Word of God. Exhorting each other. Doing things God's way. And as we read there, what, what is true love for God? Keeping His Word. So now we're going to dive in. What's, what's keeping God's Word when it comes to heart? Loving with your heart. When it comes to loving Him with your mind. When it comes to loving him with your soul, we already kind of talked about the soul part. Salvation. Obeying the gospel. His, obeying his command to get saved and born again. Okay? To give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. Okay? With all your strength. Okay? I can do all things through Christ 
which strengthens me because we can't make it on our own strength, but we're supposed to come that first step and turn to God and say, Lord, I'm here. I need your help. Getting away from the world, that takes strength. Right? Turning to God, that takes strength. But mainly, loving God with strength has to do with your actions, once again. Uh, you know, endurance, enduring tribulation, enduring being put down, enduring losing so much. I've lost so much standing for the Lord. I lost my wife. I lost my daughter. I've lost family members. I lost all my friends. I live a, a really solitude life. I don't like it, but sometimes it's great, but sometimes it's lonely. It's very lonely living a solitude life. There's a great cost to being a Christian in these last days, living the life of Christ in these last days. And that loneliness and that cost can try to push you to go back to resurrecting the old man. Paul talks about that, resurrecting the old man. That's where that strength comes in. Stay the course. We always tell people, don't faint, don't falter. Stand, stand, stand. Right? We're going to get into these a little bit more in depth. So this was an intro video. It's a long one, so we're going to leave this one for this week. And next week, we'll start on the heart. The first study, the heart. I still got another sit and talk that I want to do, but I want to get out some good, solid Bible studies. Thank you for following along and putting up with me a little bit, Brother Sis Christ, going off on a little bit of stories and testimonies and tangents. But, Brother Sis Christ, this is very important in these last days. It seems like Satan's really on the move, and he's truly trying to distort what it means to love God with all your heart. And that's going to be our next one for next week. So I want to say grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next study.